this episode of Travelog, we're going to try and avoid altitude sickness as we continue to make our way from Yunnan to Tibet on the fabled Tea and Horse Trail. It's a bumpy ride as we head over to the only Christian church in Tibet. And then we'll get some salt making lessons in Yanjing and we'll get to witness firsthand the incredible feat that is a pilgrimage to Lhasa. There'll also be a chance to get our feet wet as we head over to Ranwu Lake. Enjoy! Witnessing the hardships of the pilgrims to Tibet, escaping through Death Valley, and listening to hymns in the most remote church in China. These are some of the highlights of an amazing adventure along the 1,500-year-old Tea and Horse Trail. Travelog takes you on a legendary and perilous journey, joining a modern-day caravan as it winds its way among the rugged mountains from Yunnan to Tibet. It's a journey through a land of almost untouched culture and natural beauty. Retracing this fabled cultural and economic lifeline in China's history, join Travelog on a three-part series, Adventure on the Tea and Horse Trail. In the first part of the Tea and Horse Trail adventure, we made our way from Lijiang in Yunnan all the way to Dechin near the border of Tibet. We visited the biggest Buddhist temple in Yunnan learned to make special Tibetan butter tea and played vineyard games at the foot of the Mingyong Glacier. It was action-packed, but I guarantee you there's plenty more to come. Welcome to a travel log special. It's our third day of the Chama Gudao Trail that we're taking, and uh, we've had to get up very, very early. It's actually now about 6.30, but we had to be up at 5.30 uh, to ensure that we've got uh, enough time to pack all of our stuff and have some breakfast. We're gonna be driving for most of today, probably about over 300 kilometers towards uh, the uh, salt wells known as Yanjing, where I'll finally get to see what red salt and white salt, well, I've, I've seen white salt before, but red salt uh, really looks like. And then on towards Tibet, very exciting. We're slowly making our way through treacherous terrain into Tibet. We're driving alongside the Lansung River, whose tributaries affect the lives of over 60 million people in various ways, including food, water, and transport. Sometimes you need to pay a price to see places of such beauty, and our cross to bear is the road. It really reinforces how far I feel from the modern world. Now this is a real adventure. We've been on the road for about three hours now, and uh, in all honesty, it's probably been the bumpiest ride I've ever, ever been on. There aren't any built roads yet, and uh, what they're trying to do, as you can come see, is they're just concentrating on clearing the rocks. As you can see, that's why we've had to take a quick toilet stop, uh, so that we have a chance to actually get rid of the rocks and then drive on. We come across a group of men carving rock out of the side of a mountain. They're building a road further up the trail. Price for this, around 2 million RMB per kilometer. To call this a dirt road is an understatement. Still, this hardly comes as a surprise, considering it's a relatively underdeveloped part of the country. The route often finds itself victim to falling rocks and landslides. Actually, our trip to Yanjing is almost canceled due to a landslide shutting off our path. Luckily, the good weather saves us. You have to be prepared to clear the debris off the road if you want to continue. I guess it's what generations of the Maguoto had to do.
in some respects they still actually use the horses now to carry things across treacherous lands like these and uh, to be honest they look more at ease on this road than we do in this big car. I wanted to chat with them and maybe hitch a faster ride. Well, we've left the cars behind for the last couple of uh, meters or so. We're just traveling along, seeing what it would actually feel like to be uh, walking along with uh, the Maguoto on the Chamaguda. It's pretty tiring just walking, actually, to be honest. <laughs> Tradition and modernity, cars and horses traveling at the same pace on the tea and horse trail. Interestingly, they tell me later that horses weren't always the animal of choice. Often donkeys were preferred because they can adapt better to the adverse weather conditions. Now here's an uncommon sight, a Christian church in a Tibetan architectural style. I'm actually extremely excited about this part of the journey. I've arrived at the only Christian church in the whole of Tibet, and it was established here 150 years ago by a French missionary. The church was built in the late 19th century by French missionaries from the Paris Foreign Missionary Society. The priest in residence at the church tells me that there are about 800 Christians in that area and that they all get along very well with their Buddhist neighbors. Inter-religious marriages are quite common here and people often keep to their own faith following one's matrimonial union. The whole group is fascinated by the church, but especially with the people singing inside. What I find fascinating is that the hymns are sung in Tibetan. Whilst most of the others are busy taking pictures, I sit back and enjoy the hymns. As for the hymn books, they are over 100 years old. I also come across a Tibetan Bible, which I'm told was first printed in 1948. When I think about it, it's quite remarkable to find what is the most widely read book in Western countries here in remotest Tibet. Not far from the church along the Lansan River, we come to what the locals call the salt wells. Yanjing, which literally means salt well, has made its name by producing salt for the past 1500 years. The Yanjing section of the Tian Horse Trail was the key link between the kingdom of Tubo in Tibet and the kingdom of Nanjiao in Yunnan. Down through the centuries, these two kingdoms regularly came to blows over the salt fields. Their rivalry is hardly surprising when you think that in the days of Tubo, salt was more expensive than gold. It's said that at its height, Yanjing would welcome between 400 and 500 horses a day passing along the Tian horse trail. In these parts, it's the women who tend the salt fields. They collect the salt, while their menfolk maintain the facilities and transport the salt for sale. The women carry buckets of water each weighing about 30 kilograms up from the wells and pour the water over the platforms. The salt is harvested from these platforms, covered with smoothly packed red earth rising up the sides of the gorge on stilts. A second harvest of the salt stalactite yields something quite unusual, red salt. The change is achieved by allowing the water to remain in the pools and evaporate. The reddish salt left behind takes its colour from the iron oxide in the earth. Locally, it's called peach blossom salt. The livestock in this part of the region consume the Yanjing salt. It's said to improve their fertility. Maybe this explains why people around the region still use this salt. As the water trickles through the packed soil, pure white stalactites of salt form underneath the platforms, which the women collect. And that's how you get salt.
Well, it's day four of our wonderful adventure. We arrived very late last night into Mang Kang, our first stop in Tibet. So I haven't actually had a real chance to look around, but I'm going to try and do some of that now. We're here in an important Tibetan monastery called Ve Se, and uh, I'm just going to go in and have a look. Since this is my first ever visit to a Tibetan Buddhist temple in Tibet, I'm careful to follow the guidelines I've been told about previously. And so, I remember to circle the temple clockwise and not touch any religious items. Vesa Temple belongs to the Gulag sect of Tibetan Buddhism, which is also known as the Yellow Sect. It's so called because its adherents wore yellow hats when the sect was formed in 1409. The Yellow Sect prohibits its monks from marrying and having children. The temple, as well as being home to 60 monks, holds regular rituals as well as an annual butter lamp exhibition. It's quite startling to see the number of people who come here to pray. Everyone I come across is spinning a mani wheel. These devices consist of a spinning cylinder containing copies of the sacred mantra or Mani Padmi Hum, written in ancient Tibetan script. The belief is that repeating this mantra accumulates merit. Having owned its own caravan, the monastery played a major role on this part of the tea and horse trail. We're extremely lucky on this whole trip. I'm seeing things I've never seen before. Here we've got two people who are, uh, who are doing a pilgrimage uh, all the way to Lhasa. So if you have a look, that's, uh, that's not easy. That's not easy. That takes a lot of effort to do that the whole way. What I'm seeing at first hand is a quite awe-inspiring demonstration of religious devotion. For Tibetans, pilgrimage represents a journey from ignorance to enlightenment, from self-centeredness and materialistic preoccupation to a deep sense of the relativity and interconnectedness of all life. The removal of materialistic preoccupation is clear for everyone to see. These people travel at an average of seven kilometers a day. They prostrate themselves in this manner from sunrise to sunset. Accompanied by a small trailer of supplies, their pilgrimage will end at the same destination as ours, Lhasa. We'll be there in four days, but it'll take them another nine months. Running from west to east, we have the New River up top, the Lansan River here, and through the bottom we have the Jinshan River. And uh, we're driving from Mangkhan to Baisu, and we've come to a beautiful spot uh, here, which has actually inspired, uh, inspired me to stop and point this place out. And that's a beautiful river here that runs into the New River. The Lansan, Jinsha, and New Rivers run in parallel through this region from north to south for 170 kilometers, whilst miraculously never converging. This area is renowned for its diversity of flora and fauna. 34 endangered species of plant life here are under state protection. A quarter of the whole country's animal species can be found in this region, including 77 that are under state protection as well. This is also a place of cultural mix, as 16 ethnic minorities reside here. <笑>你们好 so I've arrived in Chiantou where we were told uh, it, it's uh, renowned for its beautiful girls. Um, however, I've spoken with some of the locals and they said they, uh, they haven't heard of any beautiful girls here. And that it probably was back in the day there were beautiful girls. So I've, uh, I've gone for a walk around myself and all I could really find was a couple of children and uh, just one little girl. So um, maybe they knew I was coming and uh, they all decided to stay indoors tonight. Presumably, since this is the first stop after the long and treacherous journey across the Bangda grasslands, 
It's no surprise that the men of the caravan would have found the female company so beautiful. We're here at the fabled 99 twists and turns, and uh, unfortunately for us, it's not actually a Tibetan dance move. It's actually what you see behind us, which are twisting and turning roads that descend very, very, very quickly. We're gonna be going from 4,200 meters down to 2,600 meters within 10 kilometers. So, uh, very excited about catching some altitude sickness. Among the 99 twists and turns, there are 49 major U-turns. I actually started out trying to count them, but as darkness fell, it became harder and harder. I soon realized I was wasting my time. And anyway, I had more pressing matters to concentrate on. Due to the state of the road, we were well behind schedule. This meant we would be taking on the 99 twists and turns with the sun about to set. Everyone in the convoy was desperate to finish the descent before nightfall. So we're about uh, halfway down the uh, 99 twists and turns and uh, haven't suffered any sickness yet, so I'm quite happy. But we have uh, been in the car for about 10 hours uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's been something where now I'm trying to imagine actually being a Maguoto along the Chamagudao and I'm amazed, I'm amazed, because even in the safety of this 4x4 car, I actually feel quite scared. Um, it's extremely steep, I mean, we're, we're going down, you know, extremely steep gradient, and, uh, and I can't imagine that if it was raining or snowing, how these people would actually deal with this, uh, with this entire place, I mean, amazing. It took us three hours to complete this part of the trip, the last 30 minutes were by far the most hair-raising as we descended in absolute darkness with steep cliffs on one side, ready to welcome us if we came off the track. Sure. Not uh, asleep yet. <laughs> we still... How could we be asleep? We're driving in the pitch black through one metre wide roads <laughs> in steep 45 degree angle hills. No one can sleep in these conditions. As long as he doesn't sleep, I'm happy. We drove for another two hours in this state of permanent fear before we finally arrived at our destination, Basu. Basu means place at the foot of the mountain for brave people. It's no wonder, after negotiating those treacherous turns, that those at the bottom should be renowned for their bravery. and butter tea and played vineyard games at the foot of the Mingyong Glacier. It was action-packed, but I guarantee you there's plenty more to come. this episode of Travelog, we're going to try and avoid altitude sickness as we continue to make our way from Yunnan to Tibet on the fabled Tea and Horse Trail. It's a bumpy ride as we head over to the only Christian church in Tibet, and then we'll get some salt making lessons in Yanjing. Witnessing the hardships of the pilgrims to Tibet, escaping through Death Valley, and listening to hymns in the most remote church in China. These are some of the highlights of an amazing adventure along the 1,500-year-old Tea and Horse Trail. Travelogue takes you on a legendary and perilous journey, joining a modern-day caravan as it winds its way among the rugged mountains from Yunnan to Tibet. 
It's a journey through a land. Get to witness firsthand the incredible feat that is a pilgrimage to Lhasa. There'll also be a chance to get our feet wet as we head over to Ranwu Lake. Enjoy. of almost untouched culture and natural beauty. Retracing this fabled cultural and economic lifeline in China's history, join Travelogue on a three-part series, Adventure on the Tea and Horse Trail. In the first part of the Tea and Horse Trail adventure, we made our way from Lijiang in Yunnan all the way to Dechin near the border of Tibet. We visited the biggest Buddhist temple in Yunnan learn to make special Tibetan